I just want to give a little introduction. Most of you, I think, know me. Those who don't, my name is Daniel Smith. Uh, I'm the Critchlow Endowed Chair in English here at the College of New Rochelle. Um, and I'm really delighted to have a chance to talk to the woman here on my right, whose name is Anna Holmes, a journalist, a critic, an editor, an essayist, and an altogether very cool human being. Um, so over the next 45 minutes or hour or so, Anna and I are going to talk about a number of topics that are related to her career and things that she's written and thought a great deal about, feminism, diversity in the media, the changing face of journalism. Um, although we've spoken enough offstage that we'll, we'll probably digress a lot and just be pretty casual. Those in the audience who are my students will recognize the style mm -hmm. and go with it. Before we get started, I wanted to um, do a little short introduction of Anna. Um, at the risk of making her blush, she is, in my opinion, one of the smartest, wittiest, most original and talented journalists we have right now. Um, she's worn a number of different hats in her career, but she's probably best known as the founding editor of Jezebel.com, uh, which she founded in 2007, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, is there people here who are not familiar with Jezebel? Jezebel? All right, so I will give a sort of, for those who are not familiar with the website, uh, and that's what it is. It's a website, uh, a women's website. Sometimes Anna has called it a lady blog. I think <laughs> you or others have called it a lady blog. I've, I've had some trouble in the uh, run-up to this event describing Jezebel succinctly to myself or to others. So I'm going to um, cheat a little bit and quote from the website's founding manifesto, the title of which is The Five Great oh, Lies no. of Women's Magazines, uh, which might give you a sense of the kind of thing that Anna and her colleagues were reacting against when they founded the, uh, the website. So the manifesto reads, uh, and I quote, to put it simply, Jezebel is a blog for women that will attempt to take all the essentially meaningless but sweet stuff directed our way and give it a little more meaning while taking the more serious stuff and making it more fun or more personal or at the very least the subject of our highly sophisticated brand of sex joke. Basically, we'll want, we want to make the sort of women's magazine we'd want to read a magazine that would never actually see glossy paper because big name advertisers and the publishers who kowtow to them don't like it much when you point out the vulgarity of a $2,000 handbag. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the reason that Jezebel was founded. Uh, Jezebel was so successful and so influential that in 2011, rather, on uh, 30 Rock, Tina Fey parodied the website, um, naming it, I believe, Joan Snark. Right? Yeah and described it as a place, quote, where women talk about how far we've come and which celebrities have the best beach bodies, which I think is a, a description that you later endorsed. Yeah, um, but it's not true, because we didn't talk about beach bodies. We didn't talk about beach bodies, but the idea being that yes. both the serious and the, and the well, frivolous isn't quite the nicest yeah. word, but. Well, superficial is fine. I superficial. Um, so beyond Jezebel, Anna's had a, a, a varied career. Um, I'll just finish with the introduction and we'll get into the conversation. She's written and edited for numerous newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Newsweek, and the NewYorker.com. She's published uh, two books, edited two books. The first, Hell Hath No Fury, Women's Letters from the End of the Affair, is an anthology of breakup letters written by women, mostly real, but some fictional, celebrated and unknown. <coughs> Uh, from Edith Wharton to Sylvia Plath to Virginia Woolf. Her second, which I have right here, and is published in 2013 and is available for sale outside, uh, is The Book of Jezebel and has the subtitle, my favorite thing about this book, I should say, is the... I'm so glad, I'm so glad you like that Which part. is the most delightful thing, which is, I believe, from the little gold yes. books, right. Uh, so the subtitle is an illustrated encyclopedia of lady things. So the book includes, it's, it's written... Well, I can say encyclopedia on, uh, entries with lots of <laughs> illustration. And there are entries on everything from, and everyone from Janet Jackson to Miss Piggy, from uh, the concept of the cougar to gender <laughs> to silicone to Weight Watchers. Uh, Anna currently works as a columnist in the New York Times Book Review. She's written there for about Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree, uh, Professional Regrets, Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, and a great deal more. She also works as an editor of Digital Voices for Fusion, which is a cable network with a multicultural millennial audience. And I think that uh, I'd really like to discuss that job. Uh, so I'd like to just welcome Anna, and, and we'll, after we talk, we'll leave time for questions. So I'm going to force you all to clap now for Anna and welcome. <laughs> all right, so 
I have a bunch of questions, and what I think we'll do is we'll probably, like I said, digress a mm -hmm. lot. But I, um, we have a lot to cover, and I wanted to start with something that you published recently, maybe most recently, and things that you published. And this is an essay in a book titled Selfish, Shallow, and Self-Absorbed. And it's a collection of 16 essays about the decision not to have children. So um, we've talked a little bit about the subject before tonight. Uh, and I, I think I told you that I was particularly taken with the emphasis that you placed in the essay on the potential costs of parenthood in terms of one's personal and professional ambitions. And I was wondering if you could start out just by summarizing the concerns that you, you enumerate in the essay. The, per the personal and professional ones? Yeah, the, well, the, the problems with, uh, the reasons why you have decided to not have children. I think, well, there, there, are, many, there are many reasons, but I, I think the, the biggest reason is, is that um, I never felt a desire to have my own child. Um, and coupled with that is the fact that um, I am concerned or I was concerned, or am concerned, that, that having a kid would would not would, would make it very difficult, not impossible for me to do things that I want to do, like travel places, or um, take certain jobs, or just sleep in on the weekends. <laughs> and um, you know that that I guess that it could be described as, as selfish. I don't know that I would I wouldn't describe it that way. But 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 I think. As I, as I say in the piece, I'm kind of concerned. My concern was that I'd be too competent of a parent. That I, it's not that I'm worried I'd be a bad parent. It's that I would be a very, very, very good one, and that I would throw all of my energy into that, to the exclusion of, of everything else. So I think I was almost, as I said, afraid of my own competence, potential competence. Um, but that was also coupled with the fact that I had never really grown up desiring like a baby. You know, I, I didn't play with dolls in the same kind of way that I wasn't performing motherhood or parenthood. Um, as a kid, and I didn't really find it of that much interest. I find it of more interest now because my friends are now parents, and 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 I'm very happy to engage them in discussions of, about what it, it means to be a parent. And I'm adoring of their kids, and find their kids just as fascinating you know, as they do. But um, I, I I would I would be concerned that I would find myself um, chomping at the bit so to speak if I were to be. To, you a mean for, for the things that you had had before? Yeah, or the things that I still I would still want to do. Yeah. Sure. So the, the things that I had, luxury, like the luxuries I had, and also the luxuries I'd like to have in the future, like the ability to just move around when I want. Um, I, don't, I don't mean literally move from one city to another, but to travel a lot. Yeah. Um, things that I feel like I'm only now starting to be able to do because of the time that I have, or I have a job that pays me enough that I can do things like travel, either because they send me places or I can save up to take trips. Um, and and I'm, I'm just, I'm not willing to give those things up. But that word selfish, I, I think you use it in the essay. I mean, it's in the title of the book. Mm -hmm. but you use it in the essay in distinction, or contradistinction to another word, I'm trying to remember what it was, that you kind of play, put forward as a a corrective to the stigma. Oh, I, was it the word agency? It was agency, okay. the word agency. It was yeah. the distinction between the word, that's exactly right, between the word selfish and the word selfishness and agency. Yeah. And you you make, it's brief, but you make yeah. what, what seems to me a kind of bright argument for the word agency as as um, something that take off the harsh glare of the word selfish. Mm -hmm. And you also talk in the essay about the stigma that seems to attach not to, not, not necessarily just to not having children if you're a woman, but to expre even expressing the ambivalence about, yeah. about parenthood. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if it's in that essay or another one that you, you bring up, um, Charlene McRae. Uh, it's in that, that piece, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio's wife, who expressed, she has two children, as most of you know, and she expressed what she'd given up and about the ambivalence that she's felt yeah. about what it means to be a mother and how it limits certain aspects of her life mm -hmm. and was attacked on the front page of the New York Post for Yeah, of course, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But is that, I mean, is that something that you personally experience either yourself or, I, I mean, it's personal still if you see it in the media and you absorb it somehow? Like, it's, it's a question, am I, am I afraid that, I'd be, that I'm, I'd be attacked that way or that I am attacked that way? I guess or? the question is simply is how strongly you feel that, that stigma. Huh. I don't feel it that strongly. Honestly, maybe because 
Um, well, it doesn't come from my own family. My, my, my parents, my mother especially, has never pressured me to have kids. I've never gotten I really wish I had grandkids yeah. to talk, uh, which is helpful. Not to, but she also didn't pressure me to get married. Um, and in fact, I think like in a, you know, it's very possible she wouldn't have had kids. She just happened to. I think it was a mistake. I think it was a mistake. <laughs> I'm not saying that she that she regrets it, but you know, it, it's I, I just I just feel like you know. It wasn't, Happy accident, was what my right? Said of me. Yeah. <laughs> the third time. The third time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was the first, but um, so there's so there's that. But no, I, I don't feel that. I and, and, and if people are if people in my social circle are thinking those things or saying those things, I'm not hearing it nor am I really picking up on it. Um, but you're clearly picking up on it in the wider world. Sure, but, but I think the, but the wider, you know, New York is, is its own little bubble. Right. And, and, and as much as I complain about, you know, <coughs> performative parenting and that piece, as, you know, as, as seen in the streets of New York, especially Brooklyn, um, it, it, people do get married later in New York and they do have kids later, which is maybe why there's a lot more ambivalence. I mean, if, if, if I were to have had a child at the age of 22, then now at the age of 41, that, that would be all I would have known about of adulthood would have been parenting. Yeah. Um, I think the longer that I was an adult, the more unwilling I was to give up um, the adulthood that I made for myself. And, and maybe especially because of where we live. We both live in Brooklyn and we see a lot of rather expensive strollers mm -hmm. and people acting toward their children as if their children were the be all and end all, the central of, uh, right. aspect of their lives. Do you think? Do you think seeing that? I mean, I know what effect it had on me, and what effect it still has on me. Which I, I feel a, a revulsion for that kind of helicopter parenting. Yeah. As much as I'm sure I'm guilty of it sometimes, but I wonder about the effect it has on people who already feel a strong ambivalence and who see it and think, well, if I have kids. Am I going to turn it? Yeah. yeah. I know there's a fear, like, am I get, like, would I turn into that? Yeah, exactly. It's the same reason I didn't have a wedding when I got married. <laughs> I, was, I was too afraid that, that I was going to fall for this idea that, you know, that, you know, that one had to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a ceremony and have yeah. certain dress and you know, floral arrangements. So I just went to City Hall. I, it's almost like I didn't trust myself enough to like, withstand that sort of stuff, to withstand those pressures. Not that like, there would be a switch that would go off, you know, that one, one one day I would be pregnant and with a kid, and the next day I'd be with a, a newborn, and I would suddenly turn into a monster parent. Yeah. Um, but but that it, there'd be like a slow creep that I would start surrounding myself with people who only had children, and that the expectations that they had for the ways that they lived their lives or the ways they parented would start to like you know infect me, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, it's not, it, it's it's like I didn't trust myself enough to to withstand the peer pressure. Which, which may be a wise thing. I mean, this is something that my students and I, or I was talking, I was going to say my students and I were talking about, but now I'm realizing it might have been me talking to my students about, was um, how, how much history, and by what that I mean simply the environment what you live, how acutely aware of it you become, more acutely aware as you get older, you, the, the withstanding of, of kind of the, the atmosphere in which you live is something that you think you can withstand it earlier on in your life, mm -hmm. and you realize later on that perhaps you can't. So that this is another thing that comes up in, in the essay is you talk about how although things have changed over the last 40, 50 years in terms of the division of labor in the home, you are acutely aware that still it's about two to one in terms of when mothers perform, I think the most recent time you survey, uh, perform double the amount of childcare and yeah. And, uh, and, and chores that, that fathers do. Mm -hmm. And this is even when adjusting for the amount that one works in the career, yeah. uh, the second job. Mm -hmm. second, um, um, so you think that you can withstand that, but in fact, we were, we've been talking about this to some extent, in that even in my, in my marriage, when I was married, there was, there, it wasn't completely equal. Even though we had talked about it and considered it, still more of the work in terms of childcare and domestic work seem to, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. in a very disturbing way, as if it was almost a gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. And I'm not letting myself off the hook. Um, I wonder if that's something also that you had, that you thought about. Like, if, if you went into this. I, I, I thought about it in terms of what I've seen in my relationships that my friends have. Right. Um, you know, pretty equal seeming partnerships with their husbands or, or partners that once they had a kid, just something shifted and 
and and sometimes in ways that were substantial enough that I, I, kept, I would think to myself, if I was married to this guy, and then after we had a kid, he checked out the way that he is, I would have to divorce him. I mean, like, and, and my, I'm not saying my friends should divorce their husband, but, but the really striking things that would make me feel very, very resentful if I were in their shoes, my friend, my female friend's shoes. Um, and it's not even that I think that their husbands are jerks. It's just that there's an expectation that their wives, as mothers, will do certain things. Um, and then once they become competent at, the, at those things, whether it's feeding a baby in the middle of the night or changing diapers or what have you, then they're expected to keep doing it. Right. I mean, that, that's why I think that actually um, the involvement of a father from a, from a very young age, you know, from the minute the baby is born, is important because otherwise you start to learn how to do things and you start to become competent in things and then you start to be expected to do those things. And I've seen that. I've seen both things happen. I've seen you know, my male friends who've been involved in the very beginning who can you know, see that continuing on to the first, second year, fourth year, you know, and on, on, on. And I've seen um, the husbands of some women I know who, you know, got a good night's sleep for the first six months and didn't do much um, feeding or diaper changing, and then never really did after that. Yeah. So. What um, What was it like? And we will move away from the biographical at some point. But what was it like in the home you grew up? Because you said that you. You've written somewhere, I don't believe it was in an essay, that you grew up in a house littered with Ms. Magazine's ERA buttons <laughs> and other uh, detritus of gender activism. <coughs> so your, your mother was clearly very engaged mm -hmm. in, in that way, the second wave feminism. Yeah. What was it like in your home and how did uh, growing up with a mother who had those engaged concerns influence your sensibilities? About, about parenting or just about dick in general? Well, I guess to start out with about parenting and then maybe we can Break it open. Um, it's hard to say because I don't remember being that cognizant of my mother's parenting style versus my dad's. <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a cough. Um, I would say that they were both equally involved, but they probably weren't. Right. Um, you know, when I was hurt, I was probably more likely to run to her than to him. Um, but you know, at the time, as, as a kid, I just wasn't paying attention. I wasn't paying. I wasn't, um, you know, checking off boxes as to who did what. I felt like they were both there for me. But in terms of like how, how, how her interests informed my sensibility beyond that, which is maybe easier for me to pinpoint, um, I guess the easiest way to put it would be that she, I wouldn't call her strident, but she, would, she was certainly prone to uh, voice her opinions, especially when she was pissed about something, and especially when it had to do with um, her feeling that women were not getting uh, treated fairly or equally. And I think you saw evidence of that in me from a very young age. The idea that she was a feminist was not something that I felt sh shame about, or, and also it wasn't really an era, this is the you know, mid to late 70s, or even the early 80s, when, when the word was considered to be a bad one, at least not in my household. Maybe it was in the outside world, but I wasn't reading New York Times, or I wasn't, I wasn't paying much attention to like, you know, network news. Um, so it was, it was never a bad word to me, nor was it a bad concept. It seemed pretty straightforward. Like, why wouldn't you believe that, you know? Um, Do you think maybe, it's a bad word now? Do you think it's pejorative at the moment? At this very second moment? No. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, think, I think if you'd asked me five years ago, I would say yes. Yeah. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said yes. And if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have said yes. I think it has less, I think it's, it, it, it has less of a negative connotation than it used to. Like recently than you're talking about? Within the past three to four years, yeah. For what reasons? I mean, what do you attribute that to? The internet, <laughs> basically. Yeah, the internet. Say more about that. Um, what about the internet? Um, the fact that there are a lot of very <coughs> vibrant, um, voices on the internet who talk very unapologetically about feminism um, and you know by doing so undercut the idea that feminists are whatever kind of caricature they've often been, been, been made out to be um, that they're old or unmarried or can't get a man or you know, don't shave their legs all that, all that sort of stuff um, yeah I think it's I think it's because of the internet and then and you know you've seen at least I have seen some very interesting shifts happen. I mean, whether it's um, pop culture icons or stars publicly proclaiming their 
their interest in feminism in a right. way that they weren't doing before. But I think it's because of the internet. I don't think, like someone once wrote a piece within the past year where they said that you know, women like Beyonce were um, ushering in some new era of feminism. And I took issue with that because I feel like she's reflecting something. She's not, she's not, she hasn't started something. She's reflecting something that was already going on. You don't want to see it perceived as like flowing downstream from. Right. From I, I, I think she's reacting to something that was, that was yeah. happening. In, in the culture, um, and that really was happening on the internet. Um, so you're saying you, you hate Beyonce? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you have to be careful. Like to you know. have to be careful when you talk about her because as, you know people are, are, feel very strongly about her. Um, and I once said the same thing I just said to you, and someone got upset about it. But I was like, oh, as if you were hurting. Right, and I, I mean, I'm not dissing her nobody by saying that. Nobody can hurt nobody Beyonce. Nobody can hurt Beyonce. Okay. Yeah. I certainly don't think I can. Um, but yeah, I think that she and other women with that sort of high profile are reflecting something that, that was going on for quite a while. Well, when you started Jezebel, it was 2007, you, I mean, the internet had not, that, that sort of voice had not been as strong on the internet yet. I mean, the internet wasn't It hadn't been, strong It yet. hadn't been as, as strong in a, in a, it had been pretty strong in terms of like small, <coughs> personal. Like blogs, small blogs. Right, yeah. that had tiny readerships. And, and in which the writers were kind of preaching to the choir, mm -hmm. so there was, and, and all the blogs, all the blog proprietresses knew we knew one another, and they linked to one another. But it hadn't, it didn't, it hadn't kind of exploded into the more mainstream at, at that point. Yeah. So I was aware that this was going on, but it wasn't, it wasn't. And in fact, you know, I, I tried to on the site amplify those smaller blogs. When, when people would say to me or ask me, "Is Jezebel a feminist blog?" I'd say, "No, it's not," Be, only because. That was one aspect of what we wrote about, but we also wrote about stuff that had nothing to do with gender politics. And I felt it would be unfair to describe us as a feminist blog when there were sites whose very reason for existence was to just talk about feminism day in and day out. Right. Whereas this was something that was kind of the subtext of a lot of what we talked about, but it wasn't our, our sole purpose for existing, which, well, was, which was on purpose. Because I felt that if it was our sole purpose for existing, then people might not want to read us, that we'd, have, that we'd have a very small readership. But if we kind of, I was trying to be a little bit subversive, like to talk about it, and talk about feminism and gender politics enough that we might politicize readers who had come to read about the previous night's episode of The Real Housewives. Right, you had to have an audience as well. Right. You had to sort of service that mm -hmm. sort of popularizing need as well as whatever political inclinations or social inclinations might, uh, you and the staff might have. But it was so clearly positioned against, not as a feminist site, but as a site as a corrective to, yes. to mainstream media, women's and in media, particular yeah. women's magazines, glossy women's magazines, yeah. which you started at. Yes. I mean, you spent several years in the beginning of your career working yes. for those magazines. Yeah. And I, I presume working up something of a revulsion to the way. Oh, I was very pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> I was really angry about it. Um, about what in particular? Just, just about the, about the messages that, that they sold. I mean, I I had read women's magazines when I was a teenager, and they hadn't been that bad. Um, I had read teen magazines <coughs> that were you know they were could be offensive, but they they weren't as bad as they then became. And Glamour, for example, which was a magazine that I worked at uh, when I was in my late twenties. Um, when I was a teenager, I'd read it, and it had a different editor. It was a very smart magazine then, in the, in the 80s. It had become a kind of cosmopolitan clone by the time I worked there. And, and you know, the sorts of pieces that um, they would run tended to revolve around a couple of things, namely um, creating, I think I put, it, I put it to someone else's way, I called them like insecurity creation factories. So they would, they would, they would, they would, they, meaning the editors, um, would be publishing story after story, month after month, that, you know, tapped into female insecurity about looks, romantic status, sexual desirability, I mean, all the, and all, yeah, yeah. And, and all those things combined, and then would purport to solve your anxieties about those things. So if you do this, then then you'll get a boyfriend. Or if you don't bother your boy, the boyfriend that you have too much, then maybe he'll propose to you. Or if you wear this bathing suit, then you'll, you know, just like, it, it was all about the, like, the attainment of, of social status through appearance um, and through 
you know, dating or marital status. And I'm not saying that women don't care about those things, but that they, they were given outsized importance in those magazines. And they didn't, the magazines didn't reflect the varied conversations that women actually have, which can you know, be about boys, yes. But all, some women are gay, so maybe they're not about boys. And some women actually um, talk about their romantic lives or their desires for those, and then they talk about work, or they talk about politics. Like they, the, the magazines did, just didn't reflect um, the interior and exterior lives of the women that I knew. And because I worked at magazines like this and, and saw how the sausage was made, so to speak, I am, got very fed up. So I don't know that Jezebel would have existed if I hadn't worked with those magazines beforehand because I was, I was just so disgusted by the sort of stuff that we were doing. And I had, having been younger and, and read women's magazines that had some quality to them, I, I was frustrated. So I was frustrated both because of my experience as a teen reading them and I was frustrated because the fact that I was helping to create content that I didn't agree with or believe right. in. And it all kind of came to a head with the, with the website. And so it was actually perfect timing because I was really pissed off about it. Were there positive responses from your former employers after Jeff, or was it all? Uh, about, about the site? About the site, yeah, when it came out. I mean, you clearly, I know you made a, a very conscious no. decision that, that that world is now gone to me. They will never hire me again. Right. Well, so, so I, I don't know because I didn't talk to anybody. Okay. I didn't. Um, I I had been told at one point after the Jezebel had been around for maybe six or six months or a year that there were assistants who worked for Condé Nast, which is a magazine company that publishes a number of these magazines, who were afraid to be seen reading the site. But I mean, I almost don't, I mean, I don't blame them because we were often going after the magazines yeah. that the publishing company was you know, responsible for, whether it was Glamour or Vogue um, or Allure. Uh, I think it was the Big Three that they published. Um, and, but I wasn't hearing from anyone at these magazines because I wasn't talking to any of my old colleagues. I didn't want to. I didn't want to have like the. I didn't want to you know, infect them with my like. We have meeting, meeting. I, I yeah. really didn't want to, want to put them in the position of getting in trouble for associating with me because we were going out to these magazines every single day, every day, because there was so much material to go into. Like, to, and there were like you know ten large women's magazines in the United States alone, and you could just turn a page and find an ad or a story that was worthy of being ripped apart. Um, so it was really relentless for the first year and a half, two years. Just if we just went after them. But then we started, then at least I started to see them change a bit. I started to see them do things in the pages of their magazines that seemed to be a reaction to what we were doing, but I had no proof of it, right. none. Um, and I thought maybe I was seeing things. And it was only many years later when I had actually already left the site that I could look back and say, okay, well, I think we were having an effect on them. I'm not saying like a major one, but like there, there, were, there were things that they started doing, whether it was in the pages of the magazines that they were producing or the websites that accompanied those magazines that were either um, rip-offs of stuff we were doing or they were reactions to it. So for example, if we complained about uh, the fact they always had white women on the cover, which we would do, we just because it was annoying. I mean, like the, those magazines did not re reflect America. Um, I felt like we started seeing more women of color on the covers than we had before. Um, we had complained a lot about the manipulation of imagery, right. photoshopping, and you know, within like a year and a half of the site starting, Jezebel, one of them, I think maybe it was Glamour, decided to you know produce an issue, like a no Photoshop issue, um, and you know, there's I have no proof that that was a response to what we were doing, but we certainly were. Uh, relentless enough and loud enough about it that they had to have known. I mean, they had that. They had to be aware of what we were doing. Yeah, um, we were making a big stick all the time. So, so when you um, when you talk about those magazines not being reflective of the actual lives of women, the conversations that women actually have, mm -hmm. um, I, th I think about. I'm, I'm going to quote you a little bit here, if you don't mind. Okay. Quote you back at you. <laughs> uh, it's always a nice thing. That <laughs> from where? Um, me from where? No, uh, I, what I'm what I'm thinking about is is. I'm not sure exactly, I believe this is from a couple of essays that you published on the New Yorker's website. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about certain <coughs> TV shows and books that um, highlighted the intensity, the complexity um, of relationships, friendships between and among women. Mm -hmm. On the way to pick you up, I was listening to the radio and 
they were interviewing Alison Bechdel about mm -hmm. the new, soon to be on Broadway show, or maybe now on yeah. Broadway show, Funhouse, uh, Fun Home. I haven't seen it yet, I've read, yeah. I've read Alison yeah. Bechdel. Uh, does, um, does, raise your hand if you know what the Bechdel test is. So, so Alison Bechdel is a, um, a comic book artist, uh, a memoirist, and the Bechdel test is something she proposed a very long time ago, mm -hmm. I believe, as a gauge of the reality of how, in the media and in entertainment, um, conversations, relationships among women are depicted. And maybe someone who's, who can, has better memory than, than me can do it, but it's, there's a conversation between women uh, that is not about men, yeah. and, uh, and am, I, am I missing any, any other criterion? I mean, I can look it up. Right, right now, <laughs> Anybody phone to play? We can, Miranda probably knows it. Yeah, there has to be two female characters, they right. have to be named, and they have to talk to each other about something that isn't a man. Right, right. <laughs> and these, thank you very much. Yeah. And, and these, um, uh, Anna, that's Mar Miranda, Miranda. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you were writing about, about girls. And about the show girls. The show yeah. girls, mm -hmm. not about girls in general, but, <laughs> but the show girls and girls in general. And uh, a novel by Sheila Hetty called mm -hmm. "How Should a How Should a Person Be," mm -hmm. and um, you were you were saying that the thrill of these of these these things was the way that they treat quote the way that they treat heterosexual coupling is second secondary, and how they depict the profundity of female friendships. It is other women, not men. Dunham and Hetty. Sheila Hetty is the author of the novel, and Lena Dunham, of course, is the creator of Girls. Uh, it is other women, not men. They seem to be saying who most impact the evolution of girls into women. Um, you have also in this book uh, an ode to friendship yeah. between women, which, yeah. is, which is a beautiful, uh, it's kind of one of my favorite parts of the book, mm -hmm. because you, you talk about this, the first paragraph in which you're kind of, um, well, heck, I'm in front of me. <laughs> I want to say one thing. Yes, go ahead. Me. I didn't write that part. Well, nevertheless. <laughs> I, Ann Friedman wrote that, who's a, a brilliant, lovely writer. She wrote that section, so I want to give her credit. Uh, please, please, please do. Okay. But, uh, but your, your name is the editor is there, yes, so you, yes. you, you accepted it I, and you included yes, it. I did. And so, I uh, it. so enjoy the credit. Um, your eyes, your, you lock eyes across the party. You love her style. That belt, where did she get it? She seems so confident. You have to talk to this woman. And you're not surprised to find out she's funny and she lives in your neighborhood. You've already got brunch plans, movie plans. You're practically planning a vacation to Columbia together. Even for the single straight woman, meeting a man at a party holds the possibility of weeks of fulfillment, maybe months, maybe years. But truly connecting with another woman, a lifetime of friendship and support and laughter. It's shocking that no one is celebrating this. Let's run through the style section trends, shall we? And then you go yeah. on, and, and, or she goes on, rather. Um, well, you know, you know what's funny is, to, to, go, to go back to the women's magazine thing, um, so somewhat, something that was somewhat implicit in a lot of the pieces that they published was that women should regard one another as competitors. That like there, there's a finite, there's a finite number of men, and we're all you know on the hunt for them. This is what women's magazines were. Mm -hmm. were right. Yeah, and I, and I and I and I think that like a lot of women who do consider other women to be competition are coming from that place. I'm not saying it's conscious, but right. I do think that they are socialized to see other women as competition um, for any number of reasons. And maybe even professionally, because you know, it's there are fewer women at the top of you know most professions than, than there are men. So I understand why women might regard other women as competition, but I don't think that it's healthy or right. And that's why that I think had a particular resonance, as did both curls and and the book that you that, that I wrote about, because it wasn't about um, women in competition. That's not to say that they always got along. It's not to say that the characters on Girls always get along, or the yeah. characters in that book, but that um, they weren't just friends who were there to pass the time until they got married. Right, but, and even not getting along is, is, of course, part of the point. Not, not yeah. getting along on the terms of an actual yes. human relationship mm -hmm. that's about that relationship, mm -hmm. not about something outside of that relationship yeah. that they're competing for. Right. And, and you, you seem, I mean, in those New Yorker pieces, you're, you're taking out the trumpet and saying, more of this. Mm -hmm. um, has there been? I mean, that was has a few years Has there been more ago. of that? Yeah, I mean, do you, have you, hmm. I mean, since you took out the trumpet and you were like, girls, the Sheila mm -hmm. Hetty novel, and that was, you know, three, four years ago. Oh. Is, it, is, it, um, is it a change that you feel <laughs> cognizant of and that, you're, that you continue to track? 
I don't have a good answer to that question because I'm not sure what the answer is. I'm not, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel that it's gone backwards, but I don't know that I have anything I can point to as an example of this being a trend. At least it's not a trend, but it's something yeah, that, that seems yeah. to be persisting and, and, and growing. I, I do think, though, that, that both those creators, both Sheila Hetty and Lena, did open up a space for, for discussions and portrayals of those sorts of relationships. But like, has there been an explosion since then? I don't know. Well, it's um, a bit frozen, I suppose, which was, you know. It's seen frozen. Fro I, I feel very bad. I know, out. Uh, I feel this bad event about is it. over. Thank you all very much. <laughs> 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 no, I feel bad about it because actually there are a lot of kids I know who are really into Frozen and I can't, I can't like bond with them about it. Well, it spawned a thousand think pieces about mm -hmm. the fact that um, this, the, this central romance was between the two sisters. Um, I have nothing beyond that to say. Okay. Well, that is much more than what I just asked because I don't even have the Please. reference. So, um, CCMK's McKay's new web series, Aki and Saltfish, is about two best friends. What's CCMK? Um, she's a producer from London. Okay. And she has a web series. It's called Aki and Saltfish. It's about two best friends. And, like, they're the only characters in the show. <laughs> and also Broad City. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Broad City, right. I like Broad City. What's that? What's that? Broad City. Broad City, Broad City, she's playing Broad City. And then the relationship from Parks and Rec with um, mm -hmm. Leslie and Ann Perkins, and then also Donna. So these Parks are things, Rec, but it, it must be, if we're noting it, if we're being so, so like, are, are, is this notable only because we're talking about it here in this forum, or is it notable because it's notable Valentine's as something Day. new? Yes. Yes. Thank you. What, what? I said, well, and it sparked Galentine's Day. So instead of Valentine's Day, Day celebrate Valentine's your friends. Day, you have Galentine's uh, Day, where oh, really? you celebrate the, your girlfriends. Yeah. I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. That's, that's from Parks and Rec. That's from Parks and Rec? Galentine's Day. Yeah. It might be one of those things that, like, again, you see it more clearly in, in, in retrospect. Entirely. Um, yeah. And, but, you know, I, I only suspect that that's, that the, the world feels like it's opening up in general. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have like a, I can't say, well, yeah, so this, 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 and this. Although we just had some great examples. We just um, did, and Frozen is a very good film. <laughs> I mean, I'll watch it's a fine it. film. I'll so watch I, want, I want to, so it's hot in here, I realize that. Um, I, who said, did someone say very? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I want to switch gears though and talk about uh, your present work. I want to mm -hmm. talk about fusion. Mm -hmm. Your title is Editor of Digital Voices. Mm -hmm. What on earth does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> when I, I told you this the other day, I'm like, it doesn't really mean anything. It, it was kind of like a, a made-up title because I wanted to, I wanted to oversee projects that were digital. Well, maybe you should tell us what fusion is first. Okay. Also a difficult question. Fusion, fusion is a cable web, is, is a cable um, channel that I don't get because it's not on Time Warner cable yet, but some people do get. That is half owned by Disney and half owned by Univision, and is geared towards young adults, millennials, as, as uh, the marketing people like to call them. And I don't like to use the word millennials, because I think it's kind of, it's marketing speak, it's kind of um, insulting. So, but I don't work on the TV side, I work on the website, the digital side, which is, it is attached to the, to the cable channel in ways that are both profound and not. So for example, um, it's very possible that we'll premiere web series on the website that then would go to the television arm of the company. It would be like workshops online. I'm not really doing pilots for shows, but I'm doing projects that involve a lot of video um, and are often interactive in nature. So it's unlike Jezebel, which was me just editing basically blog posts, um, I'm not editing copy in the way I used to, which is a relief because I'm very tired of the, of the internet uh, fast turn economy. I, I like having the chance to take more time with things. And so digital voices basically just means it's, it's on the website, or it's digital, and it has a sensibility to it. So it's, it's, it's not just straight news, it's, it's, it's a, it has a, you know, the pieces that we're doing have a point of view. Um, one of the things, you, so I just want you, before we move on, we'll do the Q&A very soon. One of the things that we were talking about was the, um, the long story that you did well, story is maybe not the right word. It's very hard to, to explain the multimedia piece that you did um, with the New York-based artist. I'm going to get her to that last name wrong. I can't even. Tatiana Fazla. 
Well, the Lisa Day. Lisa Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And she has a project that started in New York called Stop Telling Women to Smile, mm -hmm. right? And you, um, I, I'm wondering if you could describe that project and what you did in Mexico City. Okay. So Tatiana uh, is an Oklahoma native who moved to New York. I think she's about 27. Um, and she is a, she's an artist. She's a painter and a portraitist, and she also is very tired of being street harassed by men. And started a project called Stop Telling Women to Smile, which is, you know, I'm sure the women here have, have been, probably encountered a man who at one point has said, why don't you smell some more? Something like that. Um, and that's not the worst, necessarily the worst sort of harassment one can get, but it's very common. It, 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 the idea that women are for, are, are, are in public spaces and are therefore there for your consumption if you're a man is what underlies a lot of street harassment. Um, and so and I think it's reflected in the, the phrase, stop telling women to smile. So what Tatiana does is she interviews women who are street harassed, which I'd say is probably the majority of women, and draws portraits of them that she then blows up into big posters um, and that are accompanied with a, a kind of slogan or phrase. So, uh, one might be, I'm not your baby. Um, usually, it's a phrase that's a response to what a man has said to a woman on the street. Um, and she, I believe she began the project in 2011, maybe 2012, and it started in Brooklyn where she lives. And she posted, put up these, we, we pasted posters all over her uh, Bushwick neighborhood. Then she went around the country, and she had grants and stuff. Um, and there was a lot of interest in her project, and so she went to different cities, like Baltimore and LA and Oakland, and um, put up posters there as well. So I had met her because she had, she had illustrated, and I think we'll find it. Right, she had illustrated something in here. For, well, for the entry on street harassment, I'd, I'd asked her to use the rights to one of her posters. And I don't know that we'll be able to see, you guys will be able to see it that well, but that's it right there. That's actually her, so it's a portrait of her. Um, so I'd asked her to use the rights to that, the poster in the book, and um, then last year I was having coffee with her trying to think of ways we could work together again, and she, I asked her if she left the country before with the, with the project. She said no. So I suddenly somehow convinced my bosses to let me take her to Mexico City and recreate the project there, and we picked Mexico City for a number of reasons. Um, because Fusion is half owned by Univision, we had resources, like literal human producer resources who were already in Mexico City. Um, I was interested in Mexico City because it's a very large city. It is very close to the United States compared to, let's say, cities in other countries. But yet, we don't hear much about Mexico in the United States unless it's you know, negative. And I'm not saying that street harassment is positive. But I wanted to just tell the stories of women, everyday women like us, um, in a different city. Um, and the other reason we chose it was because Mexico City has a very bad street harassment problem. Uh, so bad that they have female-only transportation, like buses and subway cars. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's on a scale that I can't imagine. It's the worst in the world, I think, according to the Ma UN. Maybe, maybe, yeah. The UN, yeah, I think they yeah. have like a... It's, it's, you know. Mexico and like maybe Egypt is, right, is up yeah. there, too. Um, so it, it felt like the perfect place to go, which sounds like an absurd thing to say. The perfect place to do our street harassment yeah. project. Worst but, <laughs> Um, but it felt like the right place to go. So I went to Mexico City with her in September of last year, and she recreated the project there, which is, to, which is to say she didn't bring the posters that she'd made in the United States and then put them up around the city. There was a meeting with about 100 women, local women, women who talked about their experiences, and we took their photos and we interviewed them on camera, and she decided, uh, she picked six or seven to draw portraits of, and then we had the posters made up, and. You know, the, the, the slogans were in Spanish, um, and we spent about three days driving around Mexico City in a van, putting up posters and trying to avoid the police, because it's not legal to do that. Um, and we were successful in avoiding the police and in putting them up. And so what came out of that whole trip was a, an interactive, maybe that's the right word, way to put it. It's, it's kind of like a travel log, it's kind of like an art exhibit, but um, it kind of fits the digital voices the idea behind digital voices, which is that we're doing slow cooked content, not like quick reaction stuff, uh, that has a point of view. In this case, street harassment is bad. Um, that privileges the voices of young women of color, um, not just the women who were in the project, but Tatiana herself. Um, and 
you know, has something important to say. And so I, I would describe it as an interactive, but it's interactive that has elements that are pretty, you know, recognizable to anybody. There, there are a couple mini documentaries and photo galleries and stuff like that. So it's not like you, it's not like playing a game. It's that you're going through. There's stories in particular, right. women in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and sort of interactive of how she produces the art. Yeah. Well, I, given the temperature, which I'm acutely aware of, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I know I see everybody waving various pieces of paper. Um, I'd also, I just, I would like to open it up early and see if people have questions for Anna and so we could open up the discussion somehow because it's very often the most fruitful part of these events. So, on any subject whatsoever. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, I was really interested in the aspect of like you working for the magazines, and then like how did you gain the courage to step away from the magazines and you know do something totally like counteractive and you know say, listen, what's happening in these magazines is not something I agree with. I didn't see it as being courageous at the, at the time. I, I I felt like I was I was just I was very fed up, but I was I was terrified because. I felt like um, if I was going to do this, then I had to do it very honestly, which was to say, don't hold back at all. And if I wasn't going to hold back at all, then I would never work for those magazines again. And it's not that I wanted to work for them again, but like they certainly didn't pay my bills. Um, so I, I was realizing that I was cutting off a, a potential source of future income if this website didn't work out. And you know, editors move around. So it wasn't just like I'd never worked for Glamour, which you know, would have been fine. It's, it's that that editor, at, that editor might have been so pissed off and then she goes to another magazine that's not a women's magazine and then I'm blacklisted and like I, you know, I'll never eat lunch in that town again. Um, that was really afraid of that. But I didn't, think, I didn't see it as, as courageous. And in fact, I was, I was almost forced into it because, I mean, it sounds horrible, but at the time, that I took that job, I was being offered a job uh, as the editor of the website for InStyle, which is the Time Inc. magazine, and I worked for them. And unlike many other women's magazines, I didn't find it to be that insulting. It was kind of straightforward, and it was it was about celebrities' houses. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly celebrated, like I guess, conspicuous consumption, but it wasn't telling you that how to get a man or please a man or keep a man, and 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 it, and it wasn't. It, they weren't really offering diet tips, and it, it didn't have that aspect to it. So I found it pretty neutral. Um, but they, I was basically being asked to be the editor of their website, so being moved from the print magazine to the digital side. And when I say I was being asked, I was being told <laughs> that I had to like, well, I was being offered this job with like, that my position at the print magazine was not gonna be around anymore. So I was flattered, but I also was like, I don't wanna be editing or, or, or pouring over red carpet photographs from some party the night before, and you know, what, what was Angelina Jolie wearing? I just had no interest in that whatsoever. And at the same time, I was offered this gig to start a women's site for Gawker Media, which was the parent company of Jezebel. So at that, I was faced with two choices, and like the idea of having to look at celebrity pictures, or think about what they were wearing, or price out the most affordable handbags for spring, or even tell someone else to do that, which just felt like so soul crushing that I took I took the other job, even though I didn't know how it was going to pan out. So it was really like, again, I don't I don't think of it as being courageous. I was aware of the fact that I was very scared, but I didn't I never thought of myself that way. Maybe looking back, I might. In the same way that when I moved to New York at the age of 18, I didn't think it was courageous. I just thought I got to get out of California. And maybe now looking back, I can think, oh, okay, that was a big deal. Um, but it, it felt it felt like something I had to do at the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question regarding the first part that you were talking about the uh, the, the co-parenting. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the reason a woman may go more into parenting a child versus the husband is to a internal paternal instinct to nurture more? And that's why we do more? I don't know. I mean, it, 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 I, I honestly don't have an answer, answer to that. I would imagine that like, if you bear, if you're carrying a child in your body for nine months, that you, know, you have a certain attachment to him or her that the child's father may not experience, but that doesn't mean that it's a better attachment, it just might be a different one. Um, so, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, I, no, no, go ahead. So then could that be the reason that you know it's 
It could be one of the reasons. It could be one of them, but I don't think it is the reason. And I don't think anyone really, anyone knows what the reason is. I mean, I can bring, I can you know, question these things, but I don't have the answers. Um, and, I, and if I purported to have the answers, I would tell you not to believe me because I don't believe anybody who, who claims to have the answers to anything like this. Um, but that could be one of the reasons, sure. Also, they can't be, I mean, they can't essentially be tracked. You, you, there's no way to measure right. scientifically in terms of brain chemicals or anything or hormones what people's level of attachment is. I mean, and, and that's not to say it hasn't been attempted. I mean, there are books that have been written, studies that have been conducted to, to try to measure these things, but they're so, the systems are so complex, mm -hmm. and they're so interwoven with values that in, in the end, there are more questions of how, I think, how you want to organize your world. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sir, yeah, sir. I want to piggyback on what my former student um, had to say about, um, um, uh, working and breaking away. I have several ghost friends uh, in women's publishing. I call them ghost friends because they're women, and at one point they were my friends, but I never can see them because they're always working. Uh -huh. And they're working 80 or 90 hours a week, and they're incredibly, they're the most harried people I know. And when I get them on the phone, I said, I asked them, why don't you just say no? Why don't you just say, I'm not coming in on a Saturday morning because my boss wants me in? They said, but I can't. I said, and I used to be in newspaper publishing and I mean, newspaper writing. And the newspaper writers of the 20s and the, the guy, what they did was, that happened to them, they formed unions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just want to ask you, like in your experience about being in publishing, being in journalism, uh, in, in the women's world, is there, what's the state of labor, uh, uh, labor for in your world? Well, okay. I don't work in women's publishing anymore. So, and, and it's interesting because when I did work in women's, in women's magazines, I did not feel the pressure to work that many hours a week. I felt that pressure to work that many hours a week when I ran the website, but that was totally self-inflicted because the internet is always on. And so I felt we had to constantly be feeding this beast, the beast being the readers. We're very into it. Um, <laughs> So, but the 80, 90 hours a week thing that only happened when I went to the, went to the web, um, wasn't when I was in print. Um, and I don't, and most of my friends who work in women's publishing don't work in it anymore, like they moved away. I mean, I wouldn't say they got burnt out, because like we all worked hard, but like not to the, not to our own detriment. Um, but you know, they got sick of, they got sick of the same sort of thing over and over again. They got sick of writing or editing the same sort of story. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you because I don't I don't I don't feel close enough to women's publishing right now to be able to give you a good answer. Well, um, I'm just gonna. If, if you mind me following? Uh, mm -hmm. So I read Jezebel faithfully every day, mm -hmm. and, and I've even written for the site. But what I don't see is a lot of labor-based stories. I see fashion. I see. Yeah. But I don't see. Hey, this is. Our wages are, I see stuff about gen, gender equity pay, but not mm -hmm. about how do we do something different. And I'm wondering, is that, did that develop? Was it conscious, or am I missing? Well, I don't, I don't run the site anymore. So yeah. when I was running it, we, did we have a lot of stories like that? Probably not a lot. Maybe because we weren't thinking about that sort of thing back then. I mean, it really was very reflective of, of what I thought about at any given moment, or what, what stories attracted me and then I then instructed the writers to kind of aggregate or rewrite or, or add their commentary to. It was very much a reflection of me for those years and then it was a reflection of the next editor after I left. Um, and I don't read it now. I, I mentioned that to Daniel at dinner and he seems surprised. The, re the reason being that I don't read the internet the way I used to. I don't go to websites and type in URLs. I just look at you know, social media but also after I quit I was so terrified that I was going to be irritated by what they were publishing that I thought I shouldn't look. Just for, like, for my own benefit, but also for theirs, because I was still friends with them. Um, but but you, you're mentioning labor, and I believe that today there was something on on Gawker's website, on gawker.com, the kind of best known site of that whole company, about how they're organizing to form a union for the company, for the editors and writers. So I think it is something that they're talking about, maybe you know, just internally and, the, and now externally. 
but yeah, it wasn't something that we talked about a lot. We've been talking about things like gender equity or like equal pay, but labor, not really. No, we didn't. I think you can see those things in the comments of some posts, and in fact, sometimes that was often on purpose. Something that might seem unsexy as a post that no one's going to click on. You could you could present a story in a certain way that you knew the commenters would then take it from there. Yeah. They would they would they would am amplify it with their own intelligence and with their own insights and oftentimes wit. So you know there were there were times it was purposeful that we would leave things out or not go certain places because it gave our commenters who were you know really loyal and very um, prolific a way to weigh in and to kind of change the conversation. But that's all I can I can only speak for the years that I was there. So. Um, I want to ask about the Stop Telling Women to Smile campaign. Are you currently like still involved with that in other cities? And did since 2011 has there been like a difference in the um, street harassment in Mexico City? Well, the, well, we were in Mexico last year, so it was 2014. Um, no, I mean I, I don't think that that sort of that sort of project was going to make any sort of um, meaningful change in in in, in uh, the street harassment in Mexico City is it really just starts with how the men there are socialized to view women, you know, view women. And, and a couple of posters might help for some women to come forward and talk about it, but it's it, it's not going to just change. It's not going to just change the culture. Um, and so my my involvement in it was only that I asked the artist who is in charge of the project to go to Mexico, and we we're talking about taking her to another city, um, perhaps. Um, Somewhere in South America, there's been discussion about going to Johannesburg, and there's been discussion about going to um, Egypt. But these are really expensive trips. You know, they have to send us there and put us up for a week, and we have to hire a van and like a fixer, you know, someone local who knows all the streets and can get us out of trouble if we get in trouble. Like, and, and, and Mexico City was not dangerous, but there are definitely, like, you know, if, if we go to Egypt. Um, it's more like it would be it would be a much bigger deal. We would have to ha have like security guards probably. Um, so I hope to do that. And, and if my superiors let me spend the money on that to do that, then we will. Um, I wouldn't want to make it. A, well, it, it, it couldn't be a regular thing. Meaning it couldn't be like we go to a new city every every month. It would just be too exhausting. Mm -hmm. So if we do it again, maybe we'll do it this September. It'll be like a year later. But it wouldn't be. With any more frequency than that, because it's just it takes a lot of planning just before we even leave, and then getting back, it took us five months to put together the uh, interactive itself to have to go through all the footage. So it, it was a, a very heavy lift. And I'll just say one one of the most interesting things about that story was learning that there had been a, a, a pronounced movement against street harassment in Mexico City, and I believe the 1970s mm -hmm. or 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the women who had been involved in that movement were speaking on uh, one of those documentary yeah. uh, uh, videos. And of course, today it's one of the, the worst cities. Mm -hmm. So the, the sort of the need to continually feed that movement, yeah. that, the, the, you know, the, the need to um, fight that fight continually mm -hmm. was really There's just a lot of sexualized violence against women in Mexico <clears throat> overall. Right. And this is, this is you know, on, a, on a spectrum. I mean, this is very much related to that, but you know, in New York, I'm, you know, listen, there, there's plenty of street harassment in New York, but it, it's rare that I hear a woman in New York say that she was physically assaulted in public or groped. It's very common in Mexico City that some, the, a man just think it's his right to come up and grab you. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine. So. We, have room for, we have time for just a couple more. There was. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I want to know um, what do you think the next trend in journalism would be? Like, where do you see people getting their information? What do I see getting their information? Yeah, like if you have an inkling. Or, you know. I, I will be honest with you that I don't like making predictions about journalism because there are a lot of people who like to do that, especially people on the internet, and and I think that they're often um, incorrect because it's just you can't predict. I, I can't predict that sort of thing. That said, I can I can tell you like what interests me more now than it did before, but I don't know that that's indicative of like where something is going, and it just might be where what I'm bored with at the time. And what I'm bored with at the time or right now are, are words, or at least a very quick turnaround type 
blog posts or having to react to stuff that happens in the news immediately that a lot of media um, companies and websites feel compelled to do, um, to have like a take on something. I'm very tired of that. Um, I like in-depth, long-form pieces, written pieces. I like um, the use of, the interesting use of video. I like visuals, like still photography, to tell stories. But I don't think, I don't know if that's where the internet's going or where journalism's going. Um, I'm not really that concerned about journalism. I mean, it's changing, and I think it might be harder in some ways to make a living, and for some people, and easier in other ways to make a living for other people. But I don't really, it doesn't really concern me a lot. Um, which might be a very pri privileged thing for me to say, you know. Um, I'm not just starting out. And I'm not so old that I feel like I'm being left behind. Um, so I will admit that I might be saying that from a place of total luxury and privilege. But yeah, I don't know where it's going to go. I'm, 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 I would love to know, because there are times when I think, oh, I, maybe I should just like start a, you know, design an app and make a lot of money and then retire. <laughs> but what, you know, but, but, I, but that, that's just, that's just the BS. I mean, I, I don't, if I really wanted to do that, I would do it. Um, and I keep sticking with media, so there is something in it for me. But I, I think right now what's in it for me is that I don't know what's going to happen, which is actually more exciting than when I was younger. When I was younger, you went to college, you, you know, got an internship in a magazine. Um, maybe you got hired from the internship, which is what happened to me. And then you worked your way up the magazine, or you moved laterally to another magazine and worked your way up there. And it was kind of predictable. And also, there were fewer of those spots. Um, and it was much more restrictive to anyone who didn't look like a certain type. And I think that the opportunities now are much bigger and better and broader. And, and that, so someone who's getting out of college who wants to work in media, I, if they said, what should I do? I actually wouldn't know what to tell them, which is actually uh, a, a great thing. Because before I would have said, first you have to get an internship, then you have to do this. Uh, and now you can come at it through so many different channels and you know, in many different ways. And it's actually maybe more exciting and more accessible. That is a media career. Um, and it depends less on who you know, what college you went to, who your parents know, how much money you had growing up. Those things don't matter as much. I'm not saying they don't matter, but they don't matter as much as they used to. What was the lowest point in your career so far, and how did you get through it? Oh, man, let's see. <laughs> that's a very good question. I think that's a very good question, but i gotta, I got to think um, what that might have been. I mean, it might have been when I was working at <laughs> women's magazines and hating my life. But I mean, I was also 27, and a lot of 27-year-olds are miserable because they haven't, you know, they haven't figured shit out yet. Not that I have now, but at least I'm, I'm at peace with that. Um, that was the lowest point of my career. Um, I, I want to say when I worked at Glamour, but I don't think that that's actually an honest answer. I think the honest answer might be in 2008, when I had been running the site does well for a year. Um, and I had gone off, I'd left um, the country, I'd gone off and I'd gotten married at City Hall, and then I'd left the country for like a trip, I guess you could call it a honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, when I was away, I wasn't you know, paying attention to the site, which is not something I did very often. I didn't go on vacations. I didn't um, relinquish control of it for a sustained period of time. Even going to the doctor was something I you know, didn't do very often because like the three hours I would miss. Um, so it was a big deal for me to go away for two weeks. And I came back, and two of the st my staffers, who were the most, excuse me, um, unpredictable anyway, had gotten themselves into a bit of trouble, but that, that reflected very badly on all of us. And so I came back from what was supposed to be a happy time, and was a happy time, to like, just a stinking mess of the situation that they had gotten themselves in publicly that made the whole site look bad and then started getting written up in the press and then like, you know, reverberating around the press and, and it was just a lot of um, negativity being thrown our way. And I had only just started to feel comfortable. I had only started, to, I just started to feel like the site, um, I started to relax the, into it, that the site be, that was successful, that it wasn't just gonna go down the toilet. Um, and. I remember being 
uh, upset enough about it that I was having panic attacks, um, that I felt deeply depressed and angry at them. And the thing is, I couldn't fire them because, on the one hand, I was really pissed at them, but I also felt like what they'd done wasn't worthy of them being fired. And also, if I had fired them, then the people who were going after them on the, on the outside would have been, um, that's what they wanted. I would have almost been giving in to their demands. So I really felt, I felt angry at everybody. I felt angry at the two staffers. I felt angry at the people who were attacking them. I felt angry on behalf of my other staffers who were you know, drawn into this mess. And I went on for like three weeks until it finally died down. But even then, you would see stuff crop up here and there. And like the, the whole background of what all this is is not that interesting to get into if you really care. One can just go on Google and put in Jezebel and then put in the phrase thinking and drinking, <laughs> which, which, is, which is the name of, a, of a, a, a live performance that the two staffers had appeared in, where they'd said some things that were problematic. Um, but that was very, I mean, in terms of me being like very low, um, it was then. But I don't know if that was that I was a little so low professionally. Like, I didn't think, I didn't even think the site was going to collapse. I didn't think I was going to lose my job. Um, but I felt very proprietary about that site, you know, uh, and I built it, and I felt deeply wounded by what they had done, and also very scared. Um, so I, that's that, that's that's maybe the honest answer. But it also, again, it wasn't I wasn't about to lose my job, but it just felt like something that I worked so hard for could be fractured so easily and so quickly. So how did you get through it? Um, That was the second part of the question, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, well, I mean, time passed. Um, I complained a lot to my superior, the editorial director of the company. Um, I commiserated with the other staffers who also felt like they'd been drawn into this. Um, and then, and then it passed. I mean, like there wasn't there wasn't any like magical thing that I did. I can't, you know, I can't. I wasn't. I didn't start drinking more. I didn't like. You know, <laughs> I didn't. Come, I did. I wasn't. You know, seeing a shrink at the time. I mean, I mean, I just, I just had to let it. I guess I had to keep working because the site demanded so much of me and of the staffers. We had to produce so much every single day that there was a distraction for like the ten hours that we had to do that. But then at the end of the day, I would just feel kind of really. I felt like existentially wrecked, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous now because it's just a website. But I just, I really, it, it was like, you know, I had friends of mine who said, well, it's like your baby. I'm like, well, I wouldn't really compare it to a human being. But, <laughs> but, but in terms of the care and feeding it required, constant attention, um, it, it, it was like all I, all I, it was my entire life for like two and a half years, which wasn't always the healthiest thing. So I, I think perhaps if I had been less invested in it, when that thing happened, I might have been less upset. But that this, it wasn't, like, to me, it was not an option. I had to be all in. <laughs> Baby's <laughs> sleep. Yeah, right. The internet yeah. does not yeah, sleep. No, it um, we're, there's, there's time if you want to ask more questions. We're going to, there's a, um, some refreshments in the lounge that away. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, for thank being you. here. Thank, thank you. you all for being here. <laughs>